Chapter 9 Advanced Class Sixth grade came and the school secretary called Natalie in for a conference. She was worried Bradley had gotten into trouble, but he denied it and she believed him. Hadn't he made A's all through fifth grade and given her money from his paper route? And wasn't his nose always buried in a book? So what in the hell could it be? Natalie arrived at the principal's office where they were all waiting, including Bradley, who was asked to go out and wait in the hallway. Mrs. Rosedale, your son has been doing well in school said the principal, Mr. Marshall. He was a large man in a tweed coat with a starched yellow shirt and an orange polka dot bow tie. Watching her fumble with a cigarette and lighter, he leaned forward and added, I want to assure you that he's not in trouble. Natalie remembered she couldn't smoke in his office and put her belongings away as Mr. Marshall jabbed a pen through the air and looked closely at her, trying to keep his eyes off the curves of her body in a snug, short, purple dress. A Mr. Rosedale couldn't make it today? He's out of town, she said. Bradley had learned that was code for dad is in jail. He swept his arm expansively, taking in the others in the room. Uh, Mrs. Rosedale, you know Mrs. Coolidge, Bradley's fifth grade teacher. And this is one of our sixth grade teachers, Mrs. Hamilton. The teachers nodded in greeting. This is Mrs. Wright, our social worker. He waved at a woman seated in a chair against the back wall. Okay, what are we doing here? And why do you have Bradley out in the hall? Natalie demanded. In his haranguing about the man, Mo had schooled her about how the authorities worked to keep control of everything. She couldn't trust them, and here she was in the middle of a roomful. She felt herself begin to sweat, her silky dress getting damp spots. Mrs. Hamilton spoke next. Her words came out haltingly. There was something about Bradley's mother that she didn't like. I want to let you know that Mrs. Coolidge has recommended Bradley for placement in my class. I teach the advanced sixth graders. Bradley has been near the top of his class all year. Mr. Marshall chimed in. Mrs. Rosedale, Bradley took a standardized test that shows he is in the 90th percentile for children his age. That means he is gifted. They all leaned forward and waited for her to respond. It was critical that she understood and accepted. Oh, my God. Really? Said Natalie. Really? The announcement weighed heavily, and she started to reach for her cigarettes again. She was dying for a smoke, even a puff. She had never made it past the eighth grade, and Morris was a ninth grade dropout. As long as you don't make Fs, it shouldn't matter. They'd counseled their children, thinking it was a good lesson. We have some less pleasant things we need to discuss as well, Mrs. Rosedale, said the social worker. She opened a manila folder that was about an inch thick, a file that had been started a few years ago after the Rosedales had a bloody fight and the police hauled Morris away in handcuffs at 3 a.m. Oh? said Natalie, battle ready. What would that be? She narrowed her eyes and raised her chin. Bradley missed more than a week of school last year. We understand you were evicted for not paying the rent. We also understand there was another eviction prior to that, but that time he managed to stay in school. Can you reassure us that there won't be any more evictions? Have things gotten better? Said Mrs. Wright with a pretentious smile. Morris lost his job last year, but we're better now. She lied. Tip top. Mrs. Wright pressed on. Two of Bradley's teachers have caught him falling asleep in class. Repeatedly. Bradley told them it's because he gets up at four in the morning to deliver newspapers. Is that so? And if so, why does he have to do that? Her smile vanished as if it had been wiped off her face. Both teachers and Mr. Marshall were hanging on every word, their eyes shifting back and forth between Natalie and the social worker. Natalie opened and closed her purse nervously. He wanted a paper route. I tried to talk him out of it. I think he's saving that money for college. You'll have to ask him, she said. Sometimes he gives me a few dollars to help buy food, but I never ask for it. She stared out the window, avoiding eye contact. Well, he still made straight A's. He is an impressive young man. I don't know how he does it, said Mrs. Wright, her voice tender for a moment. But the moment didn't last. What about all these domestic reports and your husband's criminal record? 
she continued, turning pages in the file. What? asked Natalie. She opened her purse, pulled out a hairbrush, and tilted her head to one side. Then she made long brush strokes through her strawberry blonde hair. The curls at the ends flipped up after each stroke. It was the next best thing to a cigarette. You have the damn reports. What do you want me to say? Uh, can you help Bradley? Can you give him quiet time to study and help him get enough sleep? The principal said. Yes, of course, said Natalie, putting away her hairbrush. The attack from the man made her recall a visit from her cousin Brenda last year. Drunken Mo had called Natalie a dumb bitch right in front of her, and Brenda had said, You better get rid of that bastard, or someone is going to take your kids away from you. Yes, I will do whatever it takes to help Bradley with his school. Of course I will, and so will his father. He had some bad luck, but he's a good man and a good father. She looked straight into Mr. Marshall's eyes when she spoke and was the epitome of self-assurance, something completely out of her character, but something she could do when it was desperately needed. Mr. Marshall asked Natalie to open the door and invite Bradley to join them. She could tell that they believed her. She knew she seemed very authentic after all. She did love her children and wanted the best for them, and it showed. Bradley came in and met his new sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Hamilton, and Mr. Marshall congratulated him on being selected for the advanced class. Natalie would never know how close she had come to losing her gifted son. In a letter to Natalie, the principal emphasized that the rules did not allow Bradley to know the results of his standardized tests. Natalie would ultimately break that rule while partying with friends. Speech slurred from countless cans of Coors beer, she called Bradley over to fuss with his hair and stammer, Look at my son. He's a genius. The principal told me all about it. And said it over and over until her friends told her to shut the hell up. It was her way of dealing with her own bitter resentment toward the school system. Intellectually gifted and a quick learner, she had never been encouraged to study or offered advanced placement when she did well. She had never been recognized for anything but her looks, a recognition limited mostly to predatory men. And as for genius, she made it up. Bradley's score was enough to qualify him for the advanced class, but he wasn't a genius. From that time on, she would get a perverse pleasure using it against him whenever he made a mistake. Bradley stayed on fire through sixth grade, inspired by the advanced class where the kids were smart and polite, wore nice clothes, and lived in big houses over on Orange Grove Boulevard. But halfway through the year, the Rosedales were evicted again. Mo hustled and found them a flat above the Ombre bus service garage on Allen Avenue. It was noisy. The roof leaked and paint was peeling off the walls in most of the rooms, but Natalie loved it. There were four bedrooms, a dining room, and a large living room, and she imagined fixing it up, redoing the floors, decorating, and buying new furniture. By now, she had four boys and was pregnant with her fifth, and they needed all the space they could get. She bragged about how Mo got them in without a deposit by promising the landlord he would paint the interior and fix a roof leak. Whenever someone rang the doorbell, the kids learned to hide in the closets. It might be the landlord. And on the rental agreement, Mo had said they only had two children. The sounds of brakes squeaking and metallic tools clinking became music to Bradley's ears. And there was the smell of diesel fumes that always came before dinner time. Rush hour traffic on Allen Avenue lasted from 4 until 6 p.m. And in the evenings, occasional yelling outside the windows or a gunfire down the street would make Natalie check that everybody was inside and the doors were locked. It was a bad neighborhood in Pasadena, which is why the rent was cheap. The bills were getting managed with the welfare checks Natalie was getting. Mo had some work driving a truck and doing side jobs he called plays, and he didn't go to jail for a while. Bradley kept throwing papers and giving some of his earnings to Natalie, and he had enough left over to open a savings account. They were doing very well then. Mo never did paint the walls or fix the roof, but the landlord was satisfied to get the rent. It didn't rain very much anyway. Towards the end of the school year, Wilson Junior High School put on a talent show and all the sixth graders were invited. Bradley was awed by the seventh and eighth graders who could play musical instruments, sing, and act. Some boys came out and did gymnastics, tumbling down a mat and doing swings and handstands on a set of parallel bars that had been put up on the stage. He could see muscles bulging in their arms, and it looked like they could defy gravity. His dream of being like Superman became bigger than life. He had to go to Wilson and be a gymnast. After the event, he flew home on his bike and dreamed all night that he was running and doing somersaults.